All right, let's talk about uh, machine learning, uh, everything you need to know in nine minutes. Uh, so I guess before we jump into that, uh, my team is creating a, a tool that I hope eventually will remove some of the pain of submitting manuscripts for publication. If you want to learn more, you can email us here. So what are some limitations of conventional statistics? The first is handling of nonlinear relationships. So uh, here's a graph. The risk of death goes up, of course, if your blood pressure is really low or really high. But with linear regression, uh, the line of best fit would say there is no relationship between systolic blood pressure and risk of death, which of course is incorrect. Conventional statistics also um, can struggle when you have high dimensional data. Uh, that means that not many people have the outcome of interest, but there's lots and lots of variables you might want to adjust for. Conventional statistics can also struggle um, when there are time varying variables. So what are variables that change over time? A uh, patient's blood pressure uh, or their mood or their blood sugar value, etc. And then also conventional statistics really can't do anything um, if you wanted to, say, build a model to interpret images. So enter machine learning. Um, the best textbook is this one here, An Introduction to Statistical Learning. And sometimes when I talk about machine learning, my mom will ask, hey, what machine are you using? Most machine learning you can actually do on your computer, uh, your, your own laptop. Uh, however, if your data set is really, really big, you might need um, some stronger computing power. So the best definition um, that I've sort of come across and put together is that machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence, which mines data for patterns. These patterns can provide a rich understanding of the data and potentially aid in prediction. But really, it's just a toolkit, and it takes a long time to know when is it the right tool for your research project of interest. The major divides in machine learning, um, so supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. And machine learning is totally useless if you don't know or if you've forgotten some basic epidemiology. So an important epi-related questions is, you know, how have you defined your outcome? And does it really represent the ground truth? What are the potential confounders versus causal intermediates? Ideally, the prediction model that you're creating, it should be trained, validated, and tested. And ideally, you want to have separate data sets for evaluating your model. A failing to do that will lead to um, predictions that are just too good to be true. Uh, Kieran Campbell and I wrote a recent paper about the basics of machine learning in New England Journal of Medicine Evidence, if you want to uh, read more. All right, so supervised learning. Um, here's a toy example. Maybe you want to build a prediction model that can identify who's going to win the Oscar uh, in, the, in the coming year. Well, in order to figure out who's going to win the Oscar for, I don't know, best actor, what you can do is have your model review past year's worth of data and Oscars. And in that data set, of course, we know who won and who lost. So we know the ground truth. And then we can build a model that can potentially help us to predict who's going to win an Oscar in the coming year. Uh, contrast that with unsupervised learning. With unsupervised learning, there's no such thing as ground truth. So for example, movie genres. I watch Good Will Hunting and I think that's a drama. My fiance says, no, 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 that's a romance. Well, I guess like neither of us are right and neither of us are wrong because there's no ground truth to, to definitively say what genre this movie is. We can use some clinical examples. So the best possible one for supervised learning, I think, is, you know, can an automated algorithm detect diabetic retinopathy um, from retinal photographs? This was published in JAMA a number of years ago. And if you read through their abstract and their methods, you'll see they use some uh, fancy deep learning techniques, including neural networks. Uh, here's an example of unsupervised learning. Uh, this study sought out to determine, is type 2 diabetes really one disease or are there subtypes or clusters of patients? Uh, this was published a few years ago in um, Lancet um, uh, Endocrinology. So uh, after you've determined what your goal is to predict some outcome um, that would fall into the category of supervised learning, and then you want to ask yourself, is your outcome continuous? Um, so an example of that might be, how many days is somebody alive for? Or uh, what is their numerical glucose value going to be? Whereas a binary outcome is just a yes or no outcome. Are they dead or alive? 
Do they develop diabetes, yes or no? Here are a, a few different examples of some um, commonly used techniques, depending on what your outcome is. And then something that you've probably heard about are neural networks. Uh, I put this in a black box because they are a bit of a black box. So the way that neural networks work, it, it's designed sort of similar to how a neuron works. And we know that with neurons, they have these dendrites. And at the dendrite, there might be some signal that's received in the nucleus and cell body. Um, either that signal is propagated down the axon or perhaps it's just terminated there. If the signal is propagated down the axon, then these axon terminals might lead to a muscle twitching, for example, or another neuron firing. And really, this is how neural networks kind of work. Uh, they were made famous by Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, and there is an input layer. This is the data that you feed into your model, um, the output layer, what the model has identified, and the hidden layers. Uh, this is where all the, 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 the magic happens. So, you know, you could train a neural network to identify what image is this. But before you do that, you would need to have some humans that, that say what uh, what this uh, image is. And, you know, uh, you could say, oh, these are puppy dogs. And I might ask you, well, how do you know? And you say, well, they're cute and cuddly. And I say, well, I guess kittens are, are cute and cuddly. So how do you know they're not kittens? And then you say, well, because, you know, they're, they're paws. And I say, well, don't cats have paws? And you say, well, yeah, yeah, cats have paws, but, you know, these are puppies. They're not kittens. But what we realize is sometimes it's hard to explain how we know something. Uh, and similarly, with a neural network, it can tell you this is a puppy, but it can't always explain how it knows it's a puppy dog. So going back to the example of the retinal photographs, what we're looking at here are all retinal photographs. And in that study published in JAMA, uh, first you have a, you know, a trained uh, ophthalmologist review these and identify what's normal and what's not normal. And you have another physician who does the same. And now your neural network can identify which are normal, which are not normal, because the doctors said which fall into each category. And the neural network can then identify patterns, um, patterns that might help to identify whether or not the future retinal photograph is normal or abnormal. And then from this study and other studies of the like, you get this receiver operating curve. If you're not sure what this is, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, but ideally, uh, models that are really good at discriminating normal from abnormal will have a line up in this top left corner. And in the study published in JAMA, you can see their area under the curve is like 99%. Okay, that's really, really impressive. I'm not going to spend too much time um, talking about unsupervised learning, um, but the, the, the branch points thereafter are mainly uh, dimensionality reduction and clustering. So here is one slide on unsupervised machine learning. Um, most often it can be used for data visualization or identifying clusters or subgroups within your data set. And sometimes it can also be helpful if you have many, many variables for each individual person and you want to reduce those to a smaller number of variables for inclusion um, in a model. So uh, here are a few takeaway points on machine learning. Machine learning is a toolkit uh, and, and it, it helps you to understand complex data sets and, and sometimes can aid in prediction. It's not a solution for all types of studies. I've found that machine learning often isn't helpful if all of your predictors um, or, or all of your variables in your data set are predominantly binary, you know, one or zero. Um, usually just good old fashioned regression can help with that. Um, machine learning certainly can be helpful when your data are high dimensional, if you have complex nonlinear relationships and or you're dealing with um, image based data. And again, supervised learning, uh, that's applied when you want to predict some outcome. Unsupervised learning, think understanding the data. Uh, here are a few studies that I'm providing as references that I was a part of. Um, if you want to learn more, this was a model that we uh, developed to predict severe hypoglycemia in hospital. Um, this model here uh, reviewed chest x-rays of um, patients hospitalized with COVID-19 um, to see how well those images could help to predict clinical outcomes. And then another model that we built, uh, this one was designed to predict how many patients would show up to an emergency department uh, each day. 
I hope you found that helpful. Um, and yeah, tune in for, for future episodes um, uh, similar to this one. Thanks so much.